Hello. This is well, wel welcome to the, the fifth of the five Gifford lectures. Uh, well done for staying the course. You are commendable, uh, I, I, and, I'm, and, and we are commendable for having done something so well that you have all these people uh, here uh, this evening. Well done. I'm babbling. Um, moving on. Uh, Indeed, starting again. Welcome to the fifth of the lectures. Uh, there's, there's little more I can say other than uh, let us start. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone, for coming. We've had both my wife Jennifer and I have been uh, having an enormously good time here at the university in Glasgow, in Scotland, uh, and so forth. The, welcome to the fifth and final of the Gifford Lectures. I do have more material. If you want like five more, we could just change our plans, you know, if, if you're up for that. But this is the one where we get to let our hair down a little bit. You know, we've been loading up with science and uh, ways of thinking about the world in the last four lectures naturalism and its consequences. And today we get to talk about what it all means, how we should behave, what uh, is our purpose in life, what our meaning in life is, and so forth. And there's at least some of you, even though you're already here sitting in the room, who are thinking, why in the world should I listen to a theoretical physicist talk about questions like meaning and morality and things like that? There's no special expertise that physics has to offer us. So the good news is that you're completely correct. In fact, this is part of my message. I'm not going to be telling you what the meaning of life is or what the difference between right and wrong is. I'm, what I'm going to be telling you is that there isn't any objective way of getting answers to those questions. It is ultimately up to you. You can be inspired by different aspects of the universe, and so you might want to listen to physicists, biologists, poets, artists, whoever, and think about it for yourself but ultimately that burden is yours. This uh, opinion is not universal, of course. When I wrote my book, The Big Picture, I thought it would be a smart idea to read many other books, not only ones that I agreed with, but ones that I would very dramatically disagree with, ontologically speaking. So one of them was this, Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. Rick Warren is an American evangelical Christian pastor. And I know that it's one of the seven deadly sins, but I am very envious of Rick Warren's book sales. The number of books of this book, of copies of The Purpose Driven Life that have flown off the bookshelves, makes me very sad as an author. And so I thought, this is something I got to read because clearly it resonates with an enormous number of people. And I opened it up, and the very first sentence, it's a classic. It's not like Jane Austen or Leo Tolstoy level classic, but it's a very good opening sentence. It says, it's not about you. That's the very first thing Rick Warren tells you. And I was surprised by that. I was expecting, you know, this is a, it sells a lot of copies. There's a certain, uh, there must be some kind of optimistic, consoling, self-help kind of attitude here. And yet right out of the gate, he's kind of challenging you. He's saying, it's not about you. Of course, the reason why is he's going to say, given his ontology, that it's about God. That in fact, God has instructions for you, gives you guidance on how to live your life. And in fact, there is a conciliatory message behind it. It's sort of not your responsibility to figure out how to live your life. There are instructions that you can get. Poetic naturalists have no such consolation in front of them. Uh, if you're a naturalist, you don't believe in God, so there's no guidance there. And if you're a poetic naturalist, you don't even believe that the universe itself really cares how you live your life, how you behave, what is right from wrong. It's therefore, in some sense, it is about you, but I think the more accurate way of saying it is to say that it's not about you, but it's up to you. When it comes to living your life, you can be, again, inspired by the universe, but it's not going to finally decide for you the answers to these difficult questions. And that can be a scary prospect in some ways. It can be a liberating prospect in other ways. So the two main themes of the talk tonight are morality and meaning, morality being what is right and wrong, right? I think we all know what this is. It's very closely connected to the idea of ethics, which are sort of the rules for figuring out right and wrong. Morality might be about, for example, uh, you cheating is wrong. Ethics might be about what counts as plagiarism when you're in school. Ethics is kind of an application of morality. Meaning is more about me personally, what do I do to bring meaning to my life? These are the sort of the two separate topics I want to focus on. 
So the first thing I want to say about poetic naturalism is it doesn't have almost anything to say about morality or for that matter meaning. It is not going to tell you what the difference between right and wrong is. It is not going to give you ethical guidelines to live your life by. But there is the subject of meta-ethics, which is not the actual rules of right and wrong, but the question of how do we decide what the rules of right and wrong are. And that is where poetic naturalism actually does have something to say. Mostly what I will say is in some sense deflationary. I think that there is a lot, there are a lot of people who put aside God, are non-religious, they love science, they study the natural world, but they feel that something has been lost when God has gone away. That sort of objectivity, that certitude, that firm foundation, not only for knowledge, but for meaning and purpose and morality in their lives. And therefore, they convince themselves that science is going to tell them the unique right way to live, the unique difference, for example, between right and wrong. So in, I don't believe that is true, but I'm going to sort of trot out one version of the argument, the strongest version I can think of it, of the argument, and then tell you why I don't think it's true. So here is an argument that the natural world should determine everything we do. Well, the natural world is all there is, right? That's, that is part of the naturalistic philosophy. Therefore, all interesting statements are statements about the natural world. The correct way of talking about the natural world, of learning what it is, according to empiricism, is science. Therefore, all interesting statements are ultimately scientific statements. That's, that's, that almost sounds like logically pretty good, right? You know, what that, I almost convinced myself when just saying that out loud. The loophole is that science is a way of talking about the world, but it's only one way of talking about the world. If we replace the statements here about statements of talking about the natural world with statements of describing the natural world, then our argument would be correct. But there are ways of talking about the world other than describing it. There are ways of talking about the world that pass judgment on it. We can all agree that something happened, but we could disagree about whether that thing that happened is right or wrong. So this argument does not tell us whatsoever that science is going to fix once and for all what that right and wrong is. The difference, of course, is a classic uh, distinction between describing and prescribing, description and prescription. Science is descriptive. Science says what happens. To give some facade of continuity to lectures, I'm going to keep trying to show images and pictures from previous lectures so that it seems like it all was planned carefully in advance. So remember this one when we were talking about Laplace and Laplace's demon, the billiard balls bouncing off each other, described very well by Newtonian mechanics. We, we talked a lot about emergence and the fact that on different levels of description there are different ways of talking. There's a way of talking about this using quantum field theory, a way of talking about it using classical mechanics, and so forth. So morality, choosing whether or not certain things are good or bad, is yet a different kind of story that we can tell about this particular picture. You might hope that in the spirit of poetic naturalism that there is only one world but many ways of talking about it that moral stories are yet another way of talking about the world that are just as adjudicable as the scientific stories are. We don't have scientific stories that are incompatible with each other. They need to be compatible, so maybe there's a uniqueness to the moral story. The problem is that it doesn't work. The problem is that there is necessarily more than one moral story we can tell about any set of things that happen in the world. This is a ridiculous toy example, but in the case of the billiard balls, you personally might think that it's good when the billiard balls are close to each other, it's bad when they're far away. All right? Somebody else thinks, no, 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 it's bad when the billiard balls are close, it's good when they're far away. The point is that there's no scientific way of deciding which one of you is correct and which one of you is not. Now, that's not to say that science has nothing to tell us about morality. There is one very, very important way that science comes in. Namely, if you have a moral theory, if you have a way of thinking about the world that tells you what is right and what is wrong, but your moral theory relies on statements about the natural world that are incorrect, then science can tell you that you're on the wrong path. Or more broadly, because people want to debate the definition of science, if you, your moral theory relies on an incorrect ontology, then you can say, using the methods of poetic naturalism, that that moral theory doesn't have any power to persuade us. 
So there's a long list of arguments you could come up with that rely on what would be, in my view, incorrect ontological presuppositions. Abortion is wrong because the soul enters a person at conception. If you think that life is a process, that there is no separate immaterial soul entering or exiting anything, then this argument has no sway whatsoever. Same-sex marriage is wrong because it is against the natural order. So I can disagree with these arguments based on my ontology, not just the basis of my moral philosophy, but even conclusions I think are right. I might disagree with the argument that is used sometimes to reach them. Murder is wrong because the Ten Commandments say so. In poetic naturalism, the Ten Commandments don't really hold that much more sway than any other set of words on any other piece of paper, but I still believe murder is wrong. We just have to do a better argument for it. Slavery is wrong, etc. This is hearkening back to the very first image I showed you, Wiley Coyote falling off the cliff, not yet noticing it. I said we had a Wiley Coyote problem. What I meant by that was we live in a society, a culture, that argues about not just what is true about the world, but how we should live in it, how we should behave, what meaning and purpose we should attach to our lives. And very often, these arguments rest on foundations of what I think are incorrect ontological presuppositions about the world. This is why I think that it is important that scientists engage with questions about philosophy, religion, morality, because if those discussions don't take into account what we know about the world, then they're not going to be ultimately very helpful. We need to reorient the way we have these discussions to take into account scientific truths, even if those scientific truths don't give us the final answer. Let me give you one very, very vivid example of this thing that I'm arguing against. This is a quote I found from the National Catholic Bioethics Center, national in the United States, about gender identity. You might know that in the modern world, there's an ongoing uh, debate that has become coming to the fore of some of our social discussions about gender identity. Are you male or female? Could you be born male and realize that you're female? Could you be biologically one gender and internally identify as a different gender? And so forth. These are all very complicated, interesting things. The National Catholic Bioethics Center does not think it's that complicated. They think that you are born male or female and that is it. So they go on. They say, well, we are either male or female persons. Nothing can change that. You, they're pointing out to them the idea of gender dysmorphia, the idea of thinking that you are trapped in a different kind of body than is really you, is just a disease. It is a false consciousness. It is not representing anything real. It's not about hormonal level or genitalia. It's an objective fact rooted in the specific nature of a person. It is at the bottom, just as they are geometrical givens in a geometrical proof, sexual identity is an ontological given. So if you believe these ontological claims, then you will reach certain conclusions about morality. I am pointing out that I can make very good arguments against these ontological claims. As a poetic naturalist, I do not believe that something like which gender you are is something separate and essential and fixed that is a way of talking about the world that we choose to employ to the purposes that we have in the current discussion. But that's all about what we can't do. What is it that we can do? So science can tell us that certain moral arguments are wrong. It will not tell us which ones are right. When we do science, when we tell these stories at different levels about the universe, these are, we have an instrumental goal in mind, fitting the data accounting for what happens, the processes and the realities of the natural world. If you have two scientific theories of more or less equal levels of simplicity and believability, you're going to pick to give a greater credence to the one that fits the data better. That is a very simple, straightforward criterion. It's not, of course, the end of the story. There's an ongoing, long, complicated discourse about how science works and so forth. It's very worth doing, but every Every sensible way of thinking about science puts fitting the data up there as something that is very, very important. The reason why morality is so different is because fitting the data just does not fix the moral theories. We can very easily imagine the same set of data, different moral judgments passed upon whether the processes are good or bad. There's no experiment you can do to choose between. So I'm emphasizing this over and over again because I think that it is such an important mistake that people make. Compare and contrast the kind of claims you get in science with the kind of claims you get in morality. The 
test you should use in your mind, whether someone says a certain claim is at heart scientific, is, well, what is the experiment I could do to determine whether this test, that whether this claim is correct or not? The reason why experiments are so effective in science is because scientific claims are ones that could be wrong. We could imagine a possible world in which the scientific claim goes one way, in which case it goes the other way. Think of these claims. The universe is expanding, continents drift, species evolve, DNA carries genetic information, momentum is conserved. Okay? I, picked, I picked true scientific statements, but the statement the universe is contracting is a scientific statement, absolutely. It is a statement that in our world happens to be false. But we could very easily imagine a universe that was in fact contracting. And then we go about being empiricists. We say, which is the universe we live in? That is the role of experiment in science. Moral claims, treat others as you would have them treat you, slavery is wrong, governments derive authority from the consent of the governed. What is the experiment I would do to do this? This is a very, I'm trying to, this is kind of a crude uh, set of examples here, because some people will say, well, you know, helping a sick person is a good thing to do. That is experimentally verifiable because I could do an experiment to show that if I don't help them, they will die. If I help them, they will become healthy again. The problem is the moral claim isn't that I should help the sick person. It's that preventing people from dying is something I ought to do, right? You might say, well, we all agree with that, but that's exactly where it becomes contentious. It's the foundations, the axioms of our moral systems, the most important starting points on the basis of which we build everything else that are the ones that are not scientifically testable, that cannot be judged by experiments. There is, happily, a bumper sticker motto that conveys this philosophy. It is, you can't derive ought from is. There's a photograph I took just this weekend in Edinburgh. It's David Hume, favorite son of Edinburgh. Glasgow wouldn't give him a job, so he went to Edinburgh. Uh, David Hume never looked like this in his life, with the toga, and he's practically naked. Uh, and his toe, apparently, you're supposed to rub David Hume's toe for good luck as you pass by. So the rest of him is green, but the toe, the right toe and his bare feet is, is bright, shiny. People rubbing it for good luck. I don't think David Hume would approve of people thinking that rubbing his toe would bring them good luck. He was more skeptical uh, than that. So one of Hume's many fun philosophical discussions was when he was talking about the fact that well, basically, he, he's the one who put forward the idea that you can't derive ought from is. He never says exactly, definitively, without question, that you can't derive ought from is. What he says is, I've seen a lot of people try to do it, and they're all silly. He makes fun of them. This is the, the way that he's writing it. I'm surprised to find, he's thinking of all these philosophers that he reads about, instead of the usual copulations of propositions, is and is not, I meet with no proposition that is not connected with an ought or an ought not. What he's pointing out is that many, many people try to derive moral truths just by looking at the natural world. Many, many people convince themselves that they succeed. Every single one of them cheats. Everything, every single one of them slips something in under the rug. And the hilarious thing is that you know he wrote this in the 1700s. For the last 300 years, people have still been doing exactly the thing that he complained about. So the reason why it can't work is really a simple matter of logic. It is not that no one has yet succeeded in deriving ought from is, in deriving moral rules from observations of the natural world. It is logically impossible to do so. If you think of a logical argument of the form x is true, y is true, therefore z ought to be true, some syllogism or some other deductive argument like that, there is no such argument. There's never an argument that starts with simple facts that are true about the natural world and then says, therefore, something ought to be true. You need to sneak something in there to make it work. So I will give you examples that are very close to real examples that I've heard people give. There's one slice of pizza left. Eating that pizza would make me happy. Therefore, I ought to eat that slice of pizza. I mean, informally, this sounds almost believable, right? Like, you would say words like this, and people would know what you meant. And therefore, if you're a little casual about it, you convince yourself, aha, I have derived an ought from an is. The first two statements are oughts. The third one, sorry, the first two statements are ises, statements about the world that I could, in fact, empirically test. The third one is an ought. Voila, I have done it. 
if you are really careful if you have been trained in logic and you go through and try to fix up the logical tightness of the syllogism you realize there was a hidden assumption in there I ought to do what would make me happy right then it works in order to derive the conclusion you want to derive about an ought I ought to eat the pizza you need to assume something that had an ought oriented content that I ought to do a certain kind of thing that which makes me happy so there's two things to take home from this one is these derivations of rules of oughtness always imply always rely on an axiom that is often left implicit and number two once you make that implicit axiom explicit it often sounds a lot less powerful and necessary than it did when you were just assuming it was true is it true that you ought to do what would make you happy I hope not in every single circumstance I hope that there are exceptions to that rule you might worry that I am um, being unfair to people who make this argument so again rather than making up crazy stories about pizza I'm going to actually give you an example of an argument like this given by once again John Searle my favorite philosopher to pick on in, uh, in this book he is a really really good philosopher you should read his stuff but we disagree about everything so I'm, I'm picking on him because why not pick on the best this is literally an argument that he gives in a paper entitled how to derive ought from is okay so I'm not cheating here he says imagine Jones says I promise to give you Smith five dollars the statements here this is not like a syllogism he's sort of gradually translating one statement into the next in ways he thinks you will find are unobjectionable therefore you could say alternatively Jones promised to give Smith five dollars i.e. Jones undertook an obligation to give Smith five dollars that is Jones is under an obligation to give Smith five dollars therefore Jones ought to pay Smith five dollars voila he's done it derived an ought from an initial is what Jones said totally cheating totally not really fair at all what's going on is that Searle is equivocating on the word obligation if you split it up very carefully the promise that is being referred to in the first couple statements are just words that Jones is saying out loud blah 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 right and then of course you can label that a promise but it's just a way of describing the actual things that Jones says in the end of the argument suddenly the idea of a promise has a moral oughtness to it it is now an obligation and therefore something that we can say ought to be true that is the missing assumption is what one ought to do what one promises to do if you allow that as a separate assumption then indeed you can derive the conclusion David Hume was right the only way you're going to derive an ought from an is is to assume an ought along with your various is's the point is that's okay we can admit it we don't need to pretend that our moral axioms that we use to get our moral systems off the ground are necessary or everyone agrees on them it is philosophically very useful and I would argue crucially important that we bring them to light and really talk about whether or not we accept these axioms or not now if you follow this argument that you can't derive an ought from an is and you also don't believe that God tells you what the oughts are you might start to worry this is again very empirically true people do start to worry that all chaos has broken loose and we are left with nothing but moral relativism if God doesn't determine right from wrong and nature doesn't determine right from wrong then should we just say there's no such thing as morality and usually at this point this is where we start talking about the Nazis <laughs> because the Nazis are the people we all agree were bad they were evil maybe today it would be the Taliban or Boko Haram or somebody like that Donald Trump I don't know but there are people all right thinking people agree are wrong and they say are you telling me I can't say that the Nazis were bad that the Nazis were evil I can't say that objectively and firmly well I'm saying that you can't say it objectively that is exactly what I am saying but I will say in a second but you can still say it so moral relativism usually construed is the idea that morality is relative to a certain community a certain way of thinking that you can't say from some godlike external perspective that what's going on here is objectively wrong all you can do is say within that community of people they're acting rightly or wrongly after all the Nazis did not think that they themselves were evil somebody thought that what they were doing was the right thing to do so moral relativism I'm going to argue against I don't think we need to go that far but what I want to point out by bringing this up is that this is not an argument 
in favor of moral objectivity. This is an anti-argument. When you say, I would be really upset if you didn't let me found my moral choices on objective truths about the world because therefore I couldn't argue against the Nazis and the Taliban, that's not an argument that you can found your moral choices objectively on facts about the world. That's an argument that you are admitting a cognitive bias. But there's a certain conclusion you want to be true, that morality is objective. What you should draw from that is that you should be especially skeptical of arguments that say morality is objective. Not that you should accept it. You're admitting that you want something to be true. That's what you have to be very, very careful, that you're not letting yourself be too easy on an argument because you want to accept its conclusion. So the fact that you really, really want to say the Nazis are evil is not an argument that there's an objective evilness to the Nazis. This sounds like philosophical hair splitting, but what I want to do is replace moral relativism with moral constructivism. The difference is that in both cases you admit that morals are not objective, not fixed by the world, but moral constructivism doesn't say they're relative to each community and I can't criticize from the outside. Moral constructivism simply admits where morality comes from. Namely, I construct it. Once I construct it, I'm very happy criticizing people. I'm very happy, to, I, I criticize people all the time, don't get me wrong. But I admit that the framework, the starting point from which those criticisms come is inside me, not the external world. So the idea is just to admit that real human beings have moral feelings, they have values, they have preferences, desires, and so forth. They might be non-systematic, some of them might be truly instinctive, some of them might come out of their, come of their culture, they might be incoherent and completely messed up, but they exist. Human beings are not blank slates, morally speaking. Not all human beings have the same moral intuitions and impulses to start out with, but they're all there, basically speaking. So we should therefore work to make sense of them, to make them rational. This is a whole field of endeavor. It's called moral philosophy. This is what gets done. You start with some intuitions about what you want, what you think should be right and wrong. You work to improve them. Trolley problems. Have you ever heard of the trolley problems? The trolley's racing down. It's going to kill one person or five people. It's up to you. you know, do you save five people at the cost of killing one person? This is exactly the kind of thought experiment you do to take your basic intuitions and try to make them more respectable, consistent, and systematic. One way of doing this is to imagine ideal conditions. One of the problems with moral systems is that we tend to pick ones that favor ourselves. So people like John Rawls, the American uh, political philosopher, invents the original position where you forget what class you're a member of, what your job is, and so forth. Otherwise, professors would always invent moral systems where professors were the awesomest, right? So you're supposed to try to forget you're a professor when you invent your moral system. At the end of the day, there is no guarantee that everyone who goes through this kind of moral uh, introspection and systematization will agree. That is to say, this is a subset, technically speaking, of moral constructivism. This is what's called Humean moral constructivism, because as usual, David Hume was there ahead of us. A Humean moral constructivist says people construct their moral systems, and we admit that different people at the end of the day might come up with different conclusions. It would be opposed to Kantian moral constructivists after Immanuel Kant, who, think it, who would say that if you really thought about it carefully, every rational human being would construct exactly the same rules of morality, the categorical imperative, and so forth. I think that Kant, in this case, is being uh, a Pollyanna. He's being a little bit too optimistic. We can imagine, in the wor words of philosopher Sharon Street, a coherent Caligula, someone whose all of their impulses were just bad, and they made their impulses extremely systematic and consistent with each other, but completely inconsistent with ours. There's no way we have of ruling that out a priori. So different people might reach different moral intuitions, different moral conclusions. But once we get there, there's nothing in the rules that says we can't use our constructed moral systems to judge what happens in the world, including by people who don't agree with us about what those moral systems are. So this might sound a little artificial, but let me point out, every single step here is just what we actually do in the world. We actually do have 
moral intuitions. We try to make sense of them. We talk to other people. Not everyone agrees. We try to find the regions of overlap. If people really, really don't agree, we put them in jail. This is not a disaster. This is just saying realistically, admitting how the world actually works. It's very much like, I like to use the analogy of uh, the rules of chess. We've all played chess. There's a set of rules. Now, the rules of chess are nowhere to be found in the core theory. Nowhere to be found in that equation of quantum fields of electrons and quarks. You say, ah, that's where the knight does that ridiculous move, and so forth. We made them up. We constructed the rules of chess. But they're also not arbitrary. Just because something is constructed doesn't mean it's arbitrary. There's a reason why the rules of chess are the way they are. We want a good game. It needs to be interesting. There's historical precedent and so forth. You can't just make up new rules and say that's just as good as the old ones. The claim of the Humean moral constructivist is that morality works the same way. Yes, we make it up. But no, it is not arbitrary. We are human beings. We do share some common moral intuitions and starting points. Therefore, we can usefully and constructively agree on what the rules of the game should be it, in many, many cases, if not the others, if not all of them. Now, there is a problem on the other side. There's, there's one side that says, uh, I can objectively get all the moral rules that I want. There's another side that is very popular in certain scientific uh, circles, which, which thinks that, you know, it's not that hard to figure out morality, that is impatient with all this talk about rules and categorical imperatives and deontology and so forth. One way of quoting them would be Bill and Ted, famous moral philosophers from my side of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Bill and Ted said in a movie that they starred in, be excellent to each other. I mean, it's good advice. It's not bad advice. I'm not saying that you should not be excellent to each other. It's a nice way of thinking about things. But there are too many people who think that that's really all you need. It's just a version of saying, all you really need is the golden rule. Everything else is just details. That's just as much wishful thinking as uh, thinking that the laws of physics are going to determine what is right and wrong. Just to give you a flavor of why this is not enough, let's look at some of the, very briefly, the alternatives. So Bill and Ted were deontologists. I don't think they actually said this out loud in the movie. But deontologists are people who think that morality is determined on an action by action basis. What you do, the kind of action you take, is moral in and of itself, regardless of what the consequences might be. So Bill and Ted would say there is something called being excellent. What you should do at every moment is try to be excellent, and that's the best you can hope for. In contrast, there are consequentialists, who are arguably, in fact, more uh, numerous among professional moral philosophers. Consequentialism, obviously, is the idea that what really matters are the consequences of your actions. If you're a utilitarian, if you think that the moral goal should be the greatest good for the greatest number, you are a consequentialist. And a consequentialist version of Bill and Ted would say, make the world a more excellent place. It's about what happens, not what you do. There's, other, there's many other approaches, obviously, to moral philosophy. Virtue ethics is one that says that what makes you moral is whether or not you embody the virtues. Courage, honor, trust, things like that. So virtue ethics have a very simple version of their Bill and Tedism. They would just say, be excellent. That's all you have to do. That's the moral goal that you should have. Whatever that means, that's the problem, right? In all of these things, there's a lot of work to be done in figuring out exactly how to implement these in the real world. Morality, moral ethic, moral philosophy, ethical philosophy, meta-ethics, these are very, very difficult questions that deserve very, very serious attention. And my claim is that basically we can agree. So I thought about having five more slides going into deontology and consequentialism and you know, remember system one and system two? System one being all the quick, uh, fast thinking that are heuristics and unconscious, and system two is the slow thinking, the conscious perception and, and logic and cognition. Deontol there's our experiments, neuroscience experiments, that show that deontology and consequentialism roughly map on to system one and system two. It's morality fast and slow, in the phrase of uh, Joshua Green, who is a psychologist and neuroscientist at Harvard. So there's many more slides I could talk about, but my message at the end of the day is, I'm not going to tell you what the difference between right and wrong is. That is kind of your job. So I decided at the end of the day to leave it there and to move on to talk about meaning. The reason we have to talk about meaning, I don't mean in the sort of uh, semantic 
sense. We're not talking about uh, language and information. We're talking literally about the meaning of life. What does it all mean? Why am I here? What should my purpose be in living my life? As with morality, where we used to have lists of do's and don'ts handed down in sacred religious texts, we used to have a feeling of who we are in the universe that was pretty clear. We were important to it. It was not absolutely universal, but if you look at the typical ancient cosmology, this is, if you look online, an image of what purports to be an ancient Hebrew cosmology. I'm not sure if it is an ancient Hebrew cosmology or a 19th century version of what they thought ancient Hebrew cosmology looked like, but it's a very, it's a characteristic um, example of this kind of thing. The point is not the details of where God is and, and where the great deep is. The point is that the earth is in the middle. Not because the earth is the best. I mean, many people try to point out that in ancient Greek cosmologies, the earth was at the center of the Ptolemaic system, not because it was the best, it was sort of the dirtiest and the, the heavens above were better. But there is some point, there is some importance, there's some central significance to our role in the cosmos in an ancient way of thinking. Science has more or less gotten rid of that uh, central role, as you may have heard. This, once again, is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Did I show you this already? I showed you like the miniature version, right? But not the maximum version. So the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, this is, you know, when I grow up and become very courageous, popular speaker, what I'm going to do is show this picture and stand here silently for 60 minutes while you contemplate this picture. This picture is what you see if you go out on a clear night with your camera and you open the shutter, you point your camera at a blank region of the sky, a region where you don't see anything, roughly speaking. You put your shutter open, you collect a lot of photons, and as long as your camera is attached to the Hubble Space Telescope, what you will see is that what you thought was a blank region of the sky is alive with galaxies. Just the other week, we learned that the number of galaxies in our observable universe is about two trillion. Every galaxy in this picture, every single dot in this picture is a galaxy. That right there, galaxy, with about 100 billion stars in it. The universe that we see looks more or less the same in every direction. There's no center to it. Every galaxy there sees things uniform around them, just like we see it here. Who knows how many lecture halls there are on uh, planets circling stars around that galaxy where they're having natural theology discussions. It is very hard in the modern cosmological view to think that humans are in any way significant. We live on a medium-sized planet, around a medium-sized star, around a medium-sized galaxy, among two trillion other galaxies. So you could feel a little bit insignificant. I'm not going to undo that feeling, sorry. You are insignificant as far as the universe is concerned, but there's still a reason to keep, uh, to keep going. What we are, in addition to, if we're not necessarily special, in that sense, we do have a special feature that we share with other parts of the universe. We are out of equilibrium. You knew I was not going to get through the whole lecture without talking about entropy and uh, the increase of the second law, right? We human beings are living creatures, as we discussed last time. That means we are organic systems. We're made of physical stuff but we're put together in a specific way. We're complex networks of chemical reactions feeding off the low entropy energy surrounding us in the environment, mostly provided by the sun. But what I want to emphasize right now is not the biochemistry of it all, but the, the real meaning of that phrase, out of equilibrium. Equilibrium is where you have a system that has reached its maximum entropy state. If something is not in equilibrium, Either it has the potential to change toward equilibrium by increasing in entropy, or it is actually changing. The characteristic feature, as Schrodinger told us, the characteristic feature of life is that it keeps moving, and it does that by taking in the free energy. The point of life is that it's not static. If there was something, if there was some object that was literally not moving, there's no definition of life that would count that as an alive being. It might be temporarily suspended and you might be able to unfreeze it later on in some science fiction scenario. But the very essence of life is motion and change, self-repair, staving off the second law of thermodynamics by borrowing low entropy energy and returning it back to the universe with a much higher energy. You can contrast a living being, whether it's a, a nematode or an earthworm or a human being, with a computer like my laptop. If I just turn on my laptop and then I walk away, it doesn't mind. 
it would just sit there forever. It would gradually decay, you know, because its protons would decay and so forth. But the computer doesn't try to sustain itself. It doesn't have that urge to keep going and to do something. Computers don't get bored. The possibility of getting bored is a feature, not a bug, of what it means to be a living, thinking human being. We are defined by the fact that we are not in a static, unchanging situation. We are in a situation that is, by definition, changing over time. So one thing that we might want to do is to embrace this idea of disequilibrium. I know there's a certain set of philosophies out there that encourage you to seek stillness, to meditate, uh, to, you know, to, to silence the chatter that is going on in your brain. And I'm all for it. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. What I'm saying is that it, it's limited in its ability to achieve true stillness. You can sit there and you can be in a meditative pose. You can clear your mind as much as you want. Remember we talked about photosynthesis and chemical respiration and your little cells making ATP and sending them around to do jobs? You're not going to turn that off. That's happening beneath you. You are a living being far from equilibrium. Beneath your stillness of mind, there's a lot of activity churning and going on. What this might hopefully remind you of is the idea that we make a mistake when we think about the goal or the meaning of life being some special ultimate state that we want to reach and would be perfect. Happiness is the current fad. If you want to, if you want to write a book that sells a million copies that is not about the purpose-driven life, you write about happiness. If I wrote a book called, you know, Cosmology and Quantum Happiness, I would sell a million copies. That would be no problem. Because people want to be happy. So I'm here to tell you happiness is overrated. I'm not against happiness. I'm all for achieving happiness. What's overrated is the idea that our goal should be to achieve happiness. Because happiness happens at a moment in time. If there's nothing you can do that makes you happy at one moment, that you just do that and keep doing it, forever and maintain that level of happiness. I am happy when I eat ice cream, but if I did nothing but eat ice cream, I would not be happy very, very quickly, right? That's because the nature of human life is not to reach some perfect state and then stay there. It is to change because even if we get somewhere we want to be, we instantly want to be somewhere else, sooner or later. Heaven was never a very good idea. There's a great, now, do I have time to do this? Uh, this is, I can't resist telling you the story. Julian Barnes, your wonderful novelist here in uh, the UK, wrote a book called The History of the World in Ten and a Half Chapters. The last chapter is about heaven. The problem with heaven is that it's based on the idea that, that we're going to go to this place and we're going to be happy forever, for infinity years. That is not actually plausible. So certain imaginative novelists have fun trying to imagine what heaven could possibly be like. So Barnes imagined that this working class British guy dies and he goes to heaven. And so in Barnes's version of heaven, the rules are the following. You can have anything you want, but you have to ask. We're not going to make any suggestions, OK? So this working class British guy, he wants to play golf, he wants to have sex, and he wants to eat breakfast for three meals a day. Those are his goals. And they're like, sure, here you go. And he does this. He gets really good at golf. He eats a lot of breakfast food, never gets fat. Much time passes, and there are you know, people you can ask. There are workers in heaven you can ask for advice. And he says, you know, I, you know, I got to say, like, I'm kind of running out of ideas. I'm running out of things to do. Like, do people ever end it? Do people ever, like, die? And, and he said, yes, absolutely. There is an option. If you want to, you can end your existence at any time. So he says, does, does anyone actually take that option? And he's told, everyone takes the option. There's no way. It is impossible to reach that level of perfect happiness and sustain it forever. That shouldn't even be our goal. What life is is a series of things happening, actions and choices that depend on what is going on around us and going on inside us. So my suggestion would be that meaning and purpose can be constructed from those desires. The word desire represents the fact that there is something we want that we don't have. Sometimes it has a slightly pejorative connotation, desire is something we should try to tamp down. But caring about other people is a desire. Loving somebody else is, is a desire. You want them to be happy. That's something you desire. I'm in favor of desire. I think that as happiness is overrated, desire is underrated. underrated. It is not objective. It is not out there in the world to be derived. It comes from within you. 
And that's the real issue that we have to be able to deal with. Poetic naturalism suggests a world in which there are no answers in the back of the book. Now that to some people means there are no answers. There's a, there's a feeling out there which I'm going to claim is a relic of an outdated ontology. It used to be, we thought, that meaning and purpose in life came from outside, came from God or came from nature or somewhere else. And when we're told that God or nature don't give us that meaning, the first response is, well, then there is no such thing as meaning. There can't be, because real true meaning could come from outside. It's analogous to, in my mind, the difference between painting by numbers and being told that you're facing a blank canvas. Okay? On the left, you have instructions. You're told what to do. It's comforting. You know exactly what you're going to get. You're told what to do. You know what's going to happen when you do the painting. On the right, it is complete freedom in what to do, which is much, much scarier. But I claim that it also is going to be more likely to result in great art. The freedom that we have to determine our own meanings and purposes in the world can be intimidating, but can also be what leads us to true greatness. The quote I like to rely on here is by the poet, Muriel Rukeyser. She says, the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. And when she says this, she's not anti-science. She actually wrote a wonderful biography of uh, Gibbs, the famous uh, physicist and chemist. But, and Rukeyser, just as much as I would, is, is perfectly happy to say, you know what, the world is made of atoms. That's true. But what brings it to life are the stories that we tell about it. There is the world out there. But if you want to give meaning to it, if you want to make it count for something, then we tell a story about it, about what we want, what we think is good and bad, what our goals are. And it's a story we tell. It is not a document we discover out there in the universe. I can't tell you how to find meaning or purpose in your life. What I can suggest is that we can be inspired by the universe. We might all have individual meanings and purposes that are radically different from each other. The point of listening to other people and their ideas about meaning and purpose is not to find ours, not to be told what ours should be, but to get ideas, to be inspired a little bit. So let me just end the talk in the next 10 minutes by pointing out some things that I find inspiring about the universe, and maybe you can choose to be inspired by them also. It's not that the universe fixes what we mean by meaning or morality, but it might give us ideas that we can follow up on. So here are the three features of our existences here in this large universe that I like to highlight as food for thought when it comes to where we should find meaning. So let's first look at mystery. Remember I showed you this picture, right? This picture of the interlocking different levels of description that a poetic naturalist might use to describe the world. There's one box highlighted in blue, the box for the core theory. It's highlighted in blue because we understand that. We have the equation for it. We're done that part. There's plenty that we don't understand. There's plenty of mystery out there. As much as I emphasized in the second of these lectures that there's something we do know about the world, we know the particles and fields you're made of, and we know the laws that they obey in the everyday regime, there's enormously more about the world that we don't know. We don't know the higher level phenomena. We don't understand economics. I think that's pretty clear. We don't understand biology, neuroscience, the brain, etc. We don't understand lots about astrophysics, galaxy formation, dark matter, dark energy. We don't understand what space-time itself is. As much progress as we've made, there's so much out there we don't know, it is, it is hard not to be inspired just a little bit by the desire to know these. The universe is this great, very, very long mystery novel that gives us little clues along the way, and we're able to figure things out. We're able to figure out just a little bit, but there's so much more we haven't yet figured out. To drive home what I mean by having this uh, be so important, I love this story by a woman, Carla McLaren. She was a New Age uh, aficionado, and I mean not just that she uh, loved New Age stuff, that was her career. She wrote books, she did courses, you could sign up. She made a living being a New Age guru. She would do your horoscope, do your aura, the whole bit. But she was also open-minded and she was curious about these people called skeptics and scientists who didn't believe what her people believed. And part of what her people, her new age friends, believed was that one of the problems with scientists is they're too arrogant. They think they know everything. 
So she talked to some scientists and what she found to her surprise was that scientists were actually, it was not hard at all to ask them a question where they would say, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> we don't know that yet, we're working on that. And she realized when she went back to her friends in the New Age movement and asked them a question, they always knew the answer. There was, no matter what happened, there was an explanation. There was a reason, as she says, stars, chi, past lives, ancestors, energy fields, interdimensional beings, there was always some precise reason, reason why. There was something very specific. That in fact, what she realized, sort of dawning understanding was, it was her new age community that in some sense was afraid of mystery. That was afraid of saying, you know, we just don't know that one. And part of the problem there is that when they don't know, they have no method for finding it out. Right? I mean, they would disagree with each other, they would argue, they would say, oh yes, there's controversies and so forth. But they would never just go, yeah, yeah, we don't know about that one, hopefully we'll figure it out. If you want to ask me, you know, what happened at the Big Bang, yeah, I don't know. We'll figure it out. We have ideas, we have no idea which one is right. We're working on that. That's the strength of science, the willingness to say that we don't know everything. And even the willingness to say, you know, that guy thinks he knows, but I'm going to prove him wrong. Okay? It happens all the time. And I really want to emphasize this because I'm going back and forth here. I'm trying to claim two things that are different but sound like they're in conflict and they're really not. There are things we know, but we don't know everything. So we want to walk the tightrope of epistemic humility. Okay? It's very easy to think we know everything. It's very easy to convince yourself, got it figured out, I'm safe. Okay? There are many scientists who take the opposite tack. And they say, you know, we know nothing. That's the awesome thing. We know nothing true about the universe. The electron, who knows whether that's real or not, okay? That's a little bit more intellectually honest, but it's still an easy way out. It's not really being honest. The hardest thing to say is we know some things, we don't know other things, and here's where the dividing line is. That's really hard to get that right. I've tried to sketch out my view of what it is. We understand the core theory. We know some things about the other aspects, but not everything. To both admit that we know something and to admit that there's other important things we don't takes a lot of courage. That is something that I would find inspirational in our search for the meaning of our own life. The flip side of mystery is, of course, discovery. There are things we don't know. We have a track record of finding things out. Therefore, it's not just an ineffable mystery. It's not just there is some mystery that we will never know about. All of the track record is, we're going to figure some of it out. Maybe we'll figure all of it out. Who knows? I see no obstacle to that. I'll, I'm not going to be around to observe it, but in the meantime, good things are going to happen. We're a tiny little part of the universe. You know, there's a lot of galaxies out there. We're not very big. It's not all about us. But we're an interesting part of it because we are self-aware and aware of our surroundings and able to think about them. We're able to represent the universe as information encoded in our brains. This journey that we went through in the last lecture from inorganic complex chemical reactions to protocells to multicellular organisms to things that developed imagination and consciousness to our present circumstances has, it took a long time, but given us this enormous ability to test ideas, imagine different possibilities, be creative, and figure out true things about the world. There's so much we figured out about the world. Obviously, we talked about the core theory. Here it is. I don't want to dwell on this so much that I forget the other things. So it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. There's a lot of other things that we have discovered, things in astrophysics, things in biology, things in neuroscience. I would say we've discovered things in philosophy, even. We haven't figured out how philosophers dress. That seems to be a mystery, but we've learned some things. We've discovered things in art, in literature, in mathematics and music, even in how to play. And that's a quintessentially human activity, having fun, playing a game. We've learned so much about the world. How can you help but be inspired a little bit that carrying on this task is part of what gives life our meaning? You can't do better, it's a bit of a cliche, but you can't do better than quote the great physicist Robert Wilson about this. Some of you might know, especially if you know about particle physics, Robert Wilson was this enormously uh, creative and influential American experimental particle physicist. He basically built Fermilab, the great American particle physics facility, 
So in the 1960s, he's trying to do the sales pitch. He's in front of Congress. He's testifying in front of a congressional committee to make Congress build Fermilab, to spend the money. And so the senator asks him, how is this going to help national security? How is this going to help defense? And Wilson, being a physicist, not a politician, says, yeah, it won't. Sorry, no help to national security. Now, you have to understand, Senator Pastore here was not trying to be a hard ass. He was in favor of Fermilab. He was trying to throw Wilson a softball so he could like, give a really poetic answer to how much this was going to help national defense and that would justify the spending. Wilson, bless his heart, in that honest, scientific way he had, couldn't help but tell the truth. He's like, no, you know, we're looking for little particles. It's going to be of no help whatsoever in building weapons or anything like that. So the senator tries again. It has no value in that respect. Wilson would not budge, but at least he got the message maybe he should try a little bit harder. He says, look, it's not about national defense directly. It's about who we are. The dignity of men, our love of culture, are we good painters, good sculptors, great poets? And then he, he does end with a bang. He says, it has nothing to do directly with defending our country except, except to help make it worth defending. To me, that's what science is all about. I wrote a whole book about the search for the Higgs boson. This is more true now than it ever was. People want to know, now we found the Higgs boson, what are we going to do with it? We found the Higgs boson, that's the point. We're not going to do anything with it. We're going to look for the next boson. Why? Because we want to know what the world is made out of. That we're out of equilibrium. We have desires. One of those desires is to find things out about the world. Maybe that's just a remnant of our evolutionary history. Who cares? It's true. It's real. And it's inside us. We want to know the answer. We're willing to spend 10 billion American dollars to do it in the case of the Higgs boson. And it was worth every single penny. The final point about our lives I want to be inspired by is the fact that they are finite. This might come off as counterintuitive at first, but I think it's kind of important. There's this wonderful discovery that's been made by biologists. Jeffrey West at Santa Fe Institute and others make these scaling relations. They're actually sort of physicists by training who take a physicist's eye and, and aim at biological problems. So they look at different things, different ways of characterizing animals and species and realize that they're related to each other. This is a plot that relates the life expectancy of different mammals to their heart rates. And you see it's a straight line. It's not a scatter plot. There's a relationship there. In fact, there's a third variable that is also very tightly related to this, which is the size of the animal, the mass in kilograms. A larger animal lives longer, but has a lower heart rate. Okay? In fact, the effects that if you're larger, you live longer, but your heart beats more slowly, exactly cancel. This line is a line of animals that on average will live for one and a half billion heartbeats. A typical mammal has a lifespan, one and a half billion heartbeats. We human beings are not typical mammals. Our hearts beat at you know, 60 beats per minute or something like that. So if you look at the curve, you would guess we will live for 35, 40 years, which is about what our life expectancy was back in the state of nature. Since then, we've invented Obamacare and the national health and so forth. We've pasteurized milk. Now we're over here. We've improved our life expectancy. We live longer than we would out there in the jungle. But you know what? It's only a factor of two that we've improved our life expectancy by on average. That gives us three billion heartbeats. Now, this is just a fancy way of saying we live between 70 and 80 years, right, on average. This is nothing new. You, you knew this already. The translation into heartbeats, I think, is especially provocative because three billion is a big number, but it's not an infinitely big number. Like three billion dollars isn't even that much. If you want to build a particle accelerator, it's nowhere near enough, right? Three billion doesn't go forever. It's clearly not infinity. And yet, the heartbeats come pretty quickly. You've squandered several thousand heartbeats just since this lecture began, right? So thinking about this plot, and by the way, it's not exact. It's just an average, OK? So don't think that you know if you exercise and your heart beats faster, your life expectancy is therefore shorter. You don't have an allotment that's going to exactly run out. It's just an average. It's just trying to remind you of the fact that there is something called the human lifespan. If we measure it in heartbeats, we realize how short it is. And there's two attitudes you could take to that. One is, I want to live forever. I'm very sad that I only get 3 billion heartbeats. 
The other attitude, the flip side of that is, I want to make every one of those heartbeats count. If I did live forever, I could just like, whatever. What, what does it matter what I would do if I live forever? I could do something interesting tomorrow. If you know that you only have three billion heartbeats, then every one of them becomes kind of special, right? You don't want necessarily to have every heartbeat be exquisite. That would, again, be a strain on your system. You want to relax. There's some chill heartbeats. There's some kicking back and recharging heartbeats that you need to allocate to yourself. But still, the clock is ticking. That is something to remember. I love, uh, while I'm in Europe, I'm not going to get to do it this time, but I love going down to Paris and visiting the catacombs underneath. If you ever get a chance to visit the catacombs underneath Paris, what happened was in the 1800s, they, they built shallow graves it kept flooding, and literally all the skeletons would just wash down the street of Paris. Okay, Not a very hygienic situation. At some point, they cleaned things up. About six million human skeletons were exhumed and put in these giant caverns underground. And they're just piled up, and you can go walk through them, through some tiny little uh, part of it. And what I love about it is how enormously whimsical it is. It's not depressing. Like, you're stacking up six million human skulls, femurs, humeruses, and so forth, at some point you start playing around. Like they make little designs, they make little hearts, you know, the people who put them up there, and they have little scraps of poetry and so forth, and the theme is always the same. Laugh now, but you'll be here eventually, right? This is a translation of one of the little poems that appears down there in the catacombs. Thus ends everything on earth, spirit, beauty, grace, talent, ephemeral like a flower blown away by the slightest wind. But don't be sad about that. Accept that. That's what it is. What are you going to do about it? The very last picture I have for you is another iconic astronomical image, just like the Hubble Deep Field. You've seen this one before. This is the pale blue dot image. This is an image that was taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft about 1.4 billion miles away from the Earth. Voyager 1 traveling out to the outer solar system. Carl Sagan and his colleagues convinced NASA to, make, to let the spacecraft, as it was getting almost too far away, but not quite, to turn around, instead of looking at outer space, to look back here at us on Earth and take one last snapshot. This is the world's most expensive selfie, okay? The whole Earth taking a picture of itself. There we are, with that little dot that we drew a, a blue circle around just so you could see it. All, everyone who is now living and everyone who has ever lived here on Earth is inside that dot, okay? Or at least their atoms are. I don't want to get metaphysical on you. So there's, there's a point here, which is that once again, maybe this makes us feel small, a little tiny dot, right? Lost in the vastness of space. That's not the point I want to make. The point I want to make is we took this picture. We human beings built a spaceship and we sent it out into the solar system, and it turned around and took a picture of the whole Earth. We figured out how to do that. We used our brains, we used our self-awareness, our ability to discover the laws of nature, our ability to apply that discovery to technology, and we used it for this incredibly frivolous purpose, because we like this picture, and that is awesome. And I think that reminds us of what we're capable of when we put our minds to it. The universe isn't telling us what to do, but we can make up our minds what to do for ourselves, and sometimes, we decide to do pretty amazing things. Thank you very much. Oh, it's tremendous, thank you. <laughs> the first half of your lecture reminded me there's a famous uh, Mitchell and Webb sketch of uh, which, uh, we had the two comedians being, uh, I think, two uh, SS officers on the street from uh, Stalingrad. Oh, yes. I know and uh, <laughs> um, I'm sure everyone's heard it, but one of them turns to the other and said, Hans, I'd look at our cat badges. It's a death's head. Hans, are we the bad guys? <laughs> <laughs> um, I literally was thinking of that sketch as I said it, but I didn't say it out loud. So thank you for taking the evening. Um, we have. Some time for questions. Oh, in the front here. So, do you have a, a microphone? microphone yeah. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, it's been a fabulous uh, series of lectures, and uh, thank you. Um, please don't give Edinburgh all the credit for. <laughs> 
for looking after Hume because they also turned him down for a job. So. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> However, um, I want, there's, a, there's a lot about this last lecture which has been, um, uh, uh, it's, it made me very um, interested, I think, in poetic naturalism, partly because it, it seems uh, so um, close in many ways to um, existential philosophy. Yep. Um, so you talk about the ennui that's possible in a living organism, and of course one of the, the tropes in existential philosophy is, is the ennui of the human being, the possibility of ennui or boredom. Um, and you also talk about death, and of course Heidegger and, and um, uh, many philosophers talk about death and its, its limitation and how we project ourselves, and we must think of projecting ourselves and make our own decisions. But the one person who kept coming back to mind, and I, I think um, had uh, we been quick enough, we might have been able to snap him up for the Giffords, but um, uh, unfortunately he was rather out of favor and also mad, um, was uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. And you, what you were saying today seemed to me very similar in many ways. Um, uh, he talks about um, the death of God, uh, though you didn't actually mention death, I think you mentioned, um, though of course is, only, is not literal either. Um, but he also mentions um, what should drive man is the transvaluation of their lives, their moral choices. They must take responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, have you, I'm not going to ask you what makes your philosophy different from Nietzsche's, because that would be far too big. Um, but have you noticed this similarity in your own in your own thinking and writing? Thank you. Yeah, so this is a great question, and the answer is yes. One of the chapters in my book is entitled Existential Therapy. I quote Kierkegaard and Camus, and I think maybe Nietzsche, I forget. Uh, he's quoted in a previous book anyway. Um, there's a lot in common. I think that, it, that there's one major, potentially important difference, is that I, to the best of my understanding, the typical existentialist believed in a more powerful version of free will than as a physicist I'd be willing to countenance. Uh, the fact that human beings can make arbitrary choices was very, very important to Sartre, for example, uh, in a way that I don't think that the laws of physics really let you do. There's a sort of emergent, effective notion of free will that I'm happy with, so it's a minor difference, but maybe an important one. But the label poetic naturalism, I, I claim no novelty for the idea behind the label I think I came up with. But many people, including professional philosophers, have come up to me and said, you know, thank you for giving me a name for the thing I believed, you know, all along. And an alternative would be scientific existentialism. I think that's perfectly okay. Okay, I want to do a second first question. I thought you were a wee bit dismissive of Kant and the model law. Um, she should not be applauded for at least trying to construct something we could aspire to, uh, a morality that's not polluted by cultural pressures, uh, religious uh, diktats, etc. Going to be nice to Kant, just for a minute. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, all right, like, <clears throat> just like with John Searle, uh, with many other people, I, I always try to pick on people I respect, like, I, except for Rick Warren. I did not pick on anyone that I really would just want to make fun of. Uh, Kant, and one of the enormously smart and incisive thinkers of modern history. I don't think there's any question. Uh, he is, he likes Searle, someone who I think that in those places where I think I understand what he's saying, I often disagree with him, but certainly in a constructive and useful way. Maybe he does give us something to, to aim for. I think that a Humean would be, Hume came before, so he didn't get a chance to respond to Kant, but uh, to me, the Humean willingness to say, look, different people are going to have different ideas about morality full stop, and there's no logical necessary reconciliation between them, is closer to the truth and a little bit more liberating. But once we sit down and say, what does it mean to be moral? What should we do? I think the Kant's one of the people you have to start reading. Here's a proposition. Please deconstruct it. Um, Everything that human beings do and think is the consequence of the evolutionary process that has resulted in the brains that we have within in our species. Some of that stuff was uh, 
is the way it is because of natural selection making it that way. Some of it may have been random things that are fixed in the human species. Some of it may be um, byproducts of constructing a brain like that. But a lot of it was uh, driven by selection. If we knew more about what the human brain has been designed to do, that wouldn't tell us what is right and wrong, but it would give us the framework for making those decisions. It would be the objective meta-ethical system from which we could then construct our morality. Right, no, I don't agree, so I get it. Uh, let me, let me, I could nitpick in the first part of what you said, but basically I think you know, we're on board. Um, what you would learn by actually studying the brain, I, I could certainly, well, there's two things. Number one, I think that we're mostly together because I think that what, what you're saying, what I did try to say is that any moral system that claims to be useful or applicable better be compatible with scientific facts about the world, and that includes how the brain works. And when I say how to be a good constructivist, begin with the fact that you have moral impulses, moral values already built in, in large measure, that can be traced to what happened over the course of evolution. But you don't want to make the naturalistic fallacy leap. You don't want to say, okay, this is what the brain wants, therefore this is what we ought to do. This is what the brain thinks we ought to do, therefore this is what we ought to do. That's the leap that David Hume is warning against you. You still have to have that discussion. All right, here is what evolution trained my brain to do. Do I really want to do that? You can even, and the, the, the discussion gets very involved. You can say, I do want to do that. Do I want to want to do that? Do I, should I want to do that? And all the thing about once you have consciousness, you can change your mind, right? It's not just the biology. The, there's an interconnection between what is going on and the levels of description get a little bit murky. But I can say, you know what, I used to think that was moral and I've talked myself out of it. So I, I think that there's enormous amounts to be learned that will be very valuable and helpful by doing the neuroscience and understanding the brain. It will not, at the end of the day, give us a foundation for our meta-ethical theories. No further questions? Up at the back there. Thank you very much. Um, so my question, I guess, really relates to, uh, in epistemology, we can we try to construct why we should believe something. Um, but I, and maybe there's, um, but, but I guess a, a further question would be, why should we accept something or why should we even pursue truth? And so what I was thinking about your, your point on uh, more, moral, uh, rejecting moral objectivism and accepting a moral constructivism, and the, the question came to mind, ought we to be moral constructivists? Um, so is your, is your reasoning simply pragmatic and why should we accept pragmatism? Like, I feel like hidden under everything is why should we even accept truth? Good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's different kinds of truth. Uh, so I think that there are instrumental reasons for accepting different kinds of truth and different ways of getting it, by which I mean the reasons why we do this are not a priori. They say, well, we have a certain goal. Relative to that goal, here is the right strategy to choose. The goal we have in doing science is we want to understand the world and account for what the data is that we observe. When we do morality, we have different goals. I would argue, and maybe this is going too far, but for the sake of the discussion, let me put it out th 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 this way. It's not that we choose to be moral constructivists. It's that secretly we all are moral constructivists. It's just some of us admit it and are good at it, and others try to pretend otherwise. People who would say that uh, they're just discovering moral truths from revelation or from nature, I would argue, are not correct. They're using a trick to construct their moral system. So uh, if, if you take the strong claim of moral constructivism, it's not something that we choose to do. It's just a description of what it is that we actually do. The question is not then, why should we be moral constructivists, but why should we choose to construct the specific things we construct? And that, I think, is a long discussion. Communicative reason gets involved. Our evolutionary history gets involved, and so forth. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to punt on giving you an actual answer to that right now. Question about the back there. And is that one here? Um, it would seem, by the way you're talking, that we've 
kind of come out of um, a moral infancy per se. Like we've gone beyond being told what to do, and we can finally, um, well, create for ourselves our own feelings. But by extension, would you also believe that by knowing more about the universe and about ourselves, that we could extend our free will? Because obviously we are bound by chemicals and everything, but we are chemicals who can know, it's, who can know themselves. So by knowing ourselves, could we extend our free will beyond what could be imagined otherwise? I'm sorry, before you get rid of the microphone, what do you mean by extend our free will? Do you have an example? Um, no, like for example, if we didn't know that, let's say, that I liked sugar because I was uh, trained to like sugar evolutionarily, I like glucose, that's because it keeps me alive. And if I didn't know that, then I, would, I might always go for sugar. Uh, or ice cream, I might always like ice cream. But by understanding that I no sugar, I know that that decision that is made unconsciously in my brain is, was molded by evolution, was molded by something which is outside my control. And by knowing it, I can start to control it. I yeah, can start so I think control. my answer to your question is yes. I, I might not use the phrase extending our free will, but I, I do think, and it's similar to the answer to the question before, uh, we have you know, another level of recursivity, right? Another level of at which we can contemplate why we make the decisions we make. It's not just uh, instinctual. We have cognition now. We can sit and go like, look, I have an instinct that makes me want to do this, but I have this other instinct that makes me want to do something different. They come into conflict. This is exactly what trolley problems and so forth try to tease out from us, where our moral intuitions don't agree with each other. How do we reconcile them? What we, we usually have the feeling that what we want to do is have a set of principles that are derived from those moral intuitions, and it's the principles that we're actually going to believe. If the principles lead us to a conclusion that is in conflict with our intuitions, our immediate responses, then we should believe what the principles say we want to do. None of us want to pay taxes. I want to keep my money, but oh, I get it, because taxes are, are contributing to the communal welfare. I guess I will do that. I reason myself into doing that. So if, if what you're asking is, are there new ways of acting and thinking about how we should act that arise because we are number one conscious, self-aware, talking, being able to talk to other people, uh, uh, acting in concert, making social contracts? Then yes, we, that's, that's a very different way of thinking, different way of coming up with rules. And I think again, it's the wily e. coyote thing. If we admit that what we're doing is moral constructivism based on our reason and our communal uh, spirit and so forth, we might come up with very different ways of acting in the world than we do just sort of going on with our momentum from a very, very different ontology that we had 2,000 years ago. There's a question down, down here, and I think the next one might be the last. But maybe. Thank you for a very interesting lecture, Dr. Carroll. And, um, Thank you for bringing up Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, too. That was, that was great. Yes, indeed. Uh, I'll show my hand right away. I am a Christian, so I believe in a supernatural power, of course. And that's why I love the slide that you had that said um, objective meaning is a relic of, out, of an outdated ontology because the definition of a relic, of course, is something that is precious and ancient and that is worth hanging on to forever. And in fact, Jesus might even say it's worth selling all of your possessions for uh, a precious relic. So that's, there's some irony in there. I, I appreciate you putting that up there, though. Um, it's the second part of that, that uh, slide that I'm not, I obviously can't agree with. It's an outdated ontology. Because when I think of a couple of the most intelligent Christians who are scientists in the 20th century, for example, like... Maximilian Kolbe, the well-known Polish philosopher who traded his life for the life of a Jewish person, person at Auschwitz, or uh, Dr. Takashi Nagai, the Japanese radiologist who gave his life to save the survivors of the Nagasaki atomic bomb. These were two genius Christians who admitted there is no objective way for them to realize that there is a God, a supernatural power that can be proven by facts, 
But nevertheless, they saw that their own experiences, that the greatest love is to lie down, to lay down one's life for your friends. They saw that having more power and more significance and actually being more truthful than any amount of scientific data that they ever accounted. So what I'm wondering is, how can your poetic naturalism be so self-limiting that it actually says no to supernatural uh, solutions? How can it say no, there's definitely no way, given that there are these experiences that, that many, many intelligent scientists, genius scientists, philosophers have had that have been to them much more truthful than any scientific fact? Right. Uh, I disagree with them about the underlying ontology for the reasons why I tried to sketch out in the first few lectures. I don't think it's a good fit to the data. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time in the series of lectures, but you can go on YouTube and find me trying to give my best case for why the naturalistic worldview itself is a better fit than a the theistic worldview to the data. Now, human beings are wonderful things. Human beings do great things. There are Christian human beings who have made enormous personal sacrifices over the years. There are Buddhist human beings and Jewish and Islamic human beings and atheist and agnostic human beings who've done wonderful things. There are Christian and Buddhist and Hindu and Islamic and atheist human beings who've done terrible, terrible things over the years. And so there's, I think that I've made a very, I always make a very, very explicit attempt when I'm talking about naturalism versus theism or science and religion to talk about what I think is true. I do not spend a lot of time trying to make an argument that religion is bad or evil or makes the world a worse place. In fact, in my book, I say very, very explicitly, look, for the last thousands of years, the smartest human beings who cared the most about what it meant to be human, what it meant to be a good person, what it meant to live a meaningful life in the world, did so in the context of a religious tradition, because everyone worked in those traditions. It would therefore be ridiculous for us in this day and age to simply disqualify everything they thought and said and the examples that they led in their lives uh, just because we disagree with their ontology. We can find wisdom and truth and goodness in things that religious people didn't said just as much as we do with modern thinkers. I'm still going to disagree with their ontology. I, I, I don't know if anyone can help me out here. I am sure that I once read a quote, and I just can't find it written anywhere, either online or in a book, uh, from Pope Benedict, not Pope Francis. Someone asked Pope Benedict, before he was Pope, uh, they asked him, what's really the most important thing about being a Catholic to you? And he said, the art and the lives of the saints. The, aesthetic beauty that's been created over the years by the Catholic tradition and the example of these human beings doing wonderful things. And that's something a poetic naturalist can get behind 100%. I think that's all the time, all the time we have for questions. But before I hand over to, b b before I hand over to <laughs> Freda Briggs to make a few concluding remarks, I, I will, I think, wrap up uh, briefly, recapitulating some uh, how we started and, re and reminding you that when Adam Gifford set up uh, the, in his will, set up the bequest which supports these lectures. He described natural theology as the knowledge of God, the infinite, the all, the first and only cause, the one and the sole substance, sole being, and so on, and finished up with, um, and the nature and foundation of all obligations and duties thence arising. And I think that that is a very long definition, uh, and there's more of it than I read out, is in a way a sort of Victorian spelling of early universe cosmology and what may or may not follow from it. I think that gives a lot of scope, a great deal of scope. And the boundaries of that scope have been very amply explored by uh, Sean in the last uh, five lectures. And so um, I would like to thank him uh, uh, myself. And uh, before you give a rousing round of applause, I'll hand over to Professor Briggs to say a few finally concluding, concluding, concluding remarks. Uh, thanks very much for oh, the microphone. So can you hear me at the back? That's great. Um, it was my pleasure and privilege on uh, last Wednesday, it was only last Wednesday, uh, to, uh, to welcome uh, Sean uh, to the University of Glasgow and to, to introduce him to many of you who are here this, uh, this evening. Um, it's my equal pleasure and privilege uh, to offer this vote of thanks as well. I think all of us have been 
enhanced by the way in which Sean has taken some really quite difficult concepts and ideas over the series of five lectures and made them accessible uh, to all of us. I think that's been a fantastic uh, performance to, to do that. I'm very, very grateful for that. I mean, it's been magnificent to listen uh, to you. And I think the second thing that's really stuck with me, I did say this to Sean, actually, uh, earlier on uh, last week, um, that I've loved the way he's answered the questions. <laughs> that what he's done is answer the question and move on. And too many of us, and I, I feel very guilty about this, often when you're asked a question at a conference or a meeting like this, you give a mini lecture in response. <laughs> And you start to lose the thread, etc. And I think the way you've handled the questions has been exemplary uh, uh, to all of us uh, here. I didn't know it was an option to give a mini lecture. I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> I really should have told you since I apologize about that. Tells me anything. But I think it's been a marvelous set of uh, five uh, Gifford lectures. We're very grateful you've, you've come uh, over to, to Glasgow, Jennifer as well. Uh, to spend some time with us. I hope you've enjoyed your experience here uh, in Glasgow. We'd love to have you back at, uh, at some point. Before you go, I just want to give you a, a small memento. Uh, it's, uh, for, for those people in the audience, you'll know what a quirk is. I'll explain to you in a, in a moment or two. Uh, but a, a quirk, as you know, uh, is very much a symbol of friendship. And this is a symbol of friendship between the University of Glasgow and yourself. And I hope that you, you Display this on your, your mantelpiece at home <laughs> or on your desk in your office. Look at this and from time to time just remember uh, your, your time here in Glasgow and in Scotland. Sean, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.